Now, the fourth major revelation is that there's two modes of knowing. Two modes of knowing. I think you're going to love this. This is spiritual psychology. This is 4,000 years old. Here are the two modes of knowing. It's from, um, from the Kata Upanishad. There are two selves, the separate ego and the indivisible Atman. That's the divinity within. When one rises above I, me, and mine, the Atman is revealed as one's real self. This sums up the teaching of the scriptures. What this means is there are two modes of knowing. And moment to moment, we are choosing, whether we know it or not, which mode to see the world from. If we choose from spirit, we are seeing from the experience of fullness. And when we are connected to that fullness, do we need for anything? No. What do we want to do when we're connected to that fullness? Share. Give. Love. And there is a joy in sharing from fullness that is way beyond any kind of sensory gratification. Way beyond it. Now, on the other hand, when we're connected to ego, the, the states within ego, now we are separated with this false illusion that it's I, me, and mine versus the world. And, if we, and all this illusion that our happiness is outside of ourselves, if only we would go and get it. And you can't talk somebody out of happiness is in money until they go out and get some money and find out that it just amplifies who you are. You know, if you're a, you know, if you're a sad person, you're going to be a sad person with a lot of money because you still have some work to do. So this idea here is now, okay, so who in their right mind would choose this lesser? Oh, by the way, spirit is the receptacle of all eternal joy. Any joy you ever feel in your life, according to Vedanta, is coming from that momentary connection with your spirit. Does that, can I hear a hallelujah? Okay? And the receptacle, the self, the ego, is the receptacle of all pain. Pain, psychic pain, cannot exist in the spirit. Because in oneness, who is there to be afraid of? What is there to lack? You can't lack anything in oneness. You are the fulfillment. Okay, so then there's those two choices moment to moment. So who in their right mind would choose this side that causes all psychic pain over this side, which is all eternal joy? And the answer is nobody in their right mind. The problem is we're hardly ever in our right mind. And that is what religious science is about. That's what all religion aspires to do, is get us out of this selfish mind so that we can become the light that God has created us as, and so it can flow through us unimpeded out into the world. So it's a two-step process. Affirm the higher and renounce the lower. If the lower within us our anger, our judgment, our self-pride. You know, there's, there's also the boasting stuff. It's not all this negativity, but it's still, if you, if you decide for pleasure in the world of the ego, that's a dualistic world. That's a world of opposites. So if you want pleasure, what's around the corner? Pain. And what's around the corner from pain? Hopefully, more pleasure. It keeps us going. It's this world of constant duality until we say enough. It's transient. If it's happening and it's going in and out like that, it cannot be real. But the joy I feel when I'm connected to spirit, that's eternal. That doesn't operate in the world of duality. So once again with Vivekananda. Oh, actually, let me, exp let me uh, give you once again. As I think this is from... How much time do I have? Am I, uh, am I okay? <laughs> God bless you. This is from the Gita. This is so, and this is along the ideas of these two wills. You understand? This is the, the, once again, this is the oldest spiritual psychology in the world, and it states there is the spiritual will, which is the will of the spirit, and what it has created you in order to bring out into the world, which is what? Love. Some form of giving, some form of light, some form of help, some form of goodness. And on the other side, not so much. And so the challenge is, as the Gita says, reshape yourself through the power of your will. Never let yourself be degraded by self-will, self with a small s. 
the wills of anger, the wills of righteousness, the wills of, of self-pity, the wills of self-pride, the wills of possessorship, that little self thinking that it has achieved anything. The truth is we are all instruments of the higher. And the more we humble ourselves before the higher, knowing full well that the higher is the truth of our being, not something outside of ourselves, the greater our spiritual power and the greater our experience of joy in life. So reshape yourself through the power of your will. Never let yourself be degraded by self-will. The spiritualized will is the only friend of the self, self with a capital S, meaning the spirit. That means a spiritualized will that understands what it is there for is to be in alignment with the spirit. So it's the intellect that is spiritualized into gracious allegiance to the will of the spirit rather than letting the horses run free. So the spiritualized will is the only friend of the self and the ego wills is the only enemy of the self. To those who have conquered themselves, the will is the friend. What are we talking about here? Conquer ourselves, conquer our anger. Conquer anything that is ill will. Does that make sense to you? The supreme reality stands revealed in consciousness of those who have conquered themselves. And so this is the challenge. The challenge is for us to take stock of those states within our ego that causes us to not be able to connect with and give out into the world the beauty of the Spirit. And so day to day, we're challenged to make those choices for which one. The, the, the problem here is the default mechanism defaults to the smallest notion of who we are because that's our story. That's the one that we have known more. We've got more history with it. And in order for us to overcome those habits, we have to plant new habits. Vivekananda said this, and this is a very powerful thing in terms of standing up. Vedanta teaches people to have faith in themselves first. As certain religions of the world say that a man who does not believe in a personal God outside of himself is an atheist, so Vedanta says that a man who does not believe in the God within himself is an atheist. Not believing in the glory of our own soul is what Vedanta calls atheism. So any moment... Every moment that you allow anger or any of the negative states within ego to, to express themselves, we are an atheist in that moment because we are allowing something other than spirit to use the faculties that spirit has created us to be able to bring itself through us. Knowing full well, once again, this is the, this is the resolution of the idea of oneness and two-ness. We know that when we're driving down the road, it's good to, to be in duality because you don't want to think that the truck coming at you is you. <laughs> and Ramakrishna said, while we are in duality, be an instrument or a servant or a child of God, knowing full well that the God you're being a servant or an instrument or a child of is the truth of who you are. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that powerful? We lose nothing and we gain everything. So, I am going to end this um, by suggesting and hoping that you'll come to our um, class this afternoon. I'm going to do a... What's that? I'm, I'm requiring... It's, it is... Uh, it, well, uh, my dad used to say, she who must be obeyed, so I will do this with Cynthia. <laughs> she who must be obeyed has said that it's required... Uh, I have a PowerPoint presentation from the passages, among the most beautiful passages from the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita. You'll learn more about this sacred wisdom that Emerson and Thoreau and Ernest Holmes and Charles and Myrtle Fillmore loved and cherished and was, were raised by. Also, let me do a plug on the books. I was, I was 25 years ago, Swami Vivekananda grabbed my heart. He died in 1902, but he grabbed my heart from some of, the, some of his uh, teachings. And I have been in the service of the wisdom ever since. Nobody goes into Hinduism to make money. Can you agree with that? <laughs> so these are one to four page selections. These are among the most cherished commentary on the oneness scriptures that the, the New Thought pioneers love so. The new book, Sacred Jewels of Yoga, I want to clarify what yoga means. Yoga in its original definition, in its highest definition, means union. 
It means oneness. So these are the sacred jewels of oneness. There are no postures in the Bhagavad Gita or the Upanishads. That came later. And God bless them. That is a, I'm, I, nothing taken away from it. It is they a powerful force for health and well-being. And it is a product of India. But the original scriptures are about yoga as oneness. These are one-page selections from the Upanishads, the Gita, the Yoga Sutras, the Astavakra Samhita. I believe that these two are the best possible way to start to see if in your heart you have inscri inscribed wanting these to be a, a relationship like they were for Emerson and Thoreau and Ernest Holmes. So I hope you will consider or ask spirit within you and consider um, making these part of your spiritual library. And we'll be in the very new bookstore that Cynthia had. Woo, 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 woo. So I hope you will do this. And uh, I promise you, this, these will not be books that, that will sit in your, uh, in your library. These will be books that you will be able to nourish yourself from and start a foundation of a relationship with these amazing scriptures that so monumentally influenced New Thought. I hope you will consider that. And I look forward to seeing you 12.30 to 3.30. I, I promise you, um, it'll be worth your time. God bless you. God bless you, Reverend Jay. Thank you very much. Thank you.